Welcome to Work Better, a Steelcase podcast where we think about work and ways to make it better. I'm your host, Chris Congdon, Editor-in-Chief of Work Better magazine. We reached out to today's guest, Lieutenant Colonel Adria Horn, after reading an article that she contributed to in McKinsey, and it's called A Military Veteran Knows Why Your Employees Are Leaving, which was really intriguing. Adria serves in the U.S. Army Reserve after many years in the military, and she's also the Executive Vice President of Workforce at Tilson Technology Management. And she comes to us with a really unique perspective drawing interesting parallels between returning to the office and returning from a military deployment. After we chat with her, we're going to be joined by Nadia Johnson, and she's the Director of Leadership and Adaptive Teams at Steelcase. Nadia will help us think through how Adria's ideas can be applied to our day-to-day work. So stay with us for that. Adria is joining us today from Maine, and I'd like to say welcome and thank you for your service, Adria. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. I'm really excited to be here. I think it would be really helpful for everybody to understand a little bit about your military background and then also your role today at Tilson Technology Management. And how do you see those two things intersecting? I have been in the military officially now for um, 21 years. It feels like crazy to even say it out loud. Um, (laughs) And uh, I went to West Point, graduated in 2001 in June when there wasn't a lot happening in the world. And in September, all of that changed. Yeah. So I would say my entire military career was completely based on the attacks on the World Trade Center. It was completely based on what happened in, on 9-11 and everything after that that followed. Mm-hmm. So I was a commissioned as a military police officer. Um, I deployed three times as a military police officer. And then I switched to what's called psychological operations while I was in Afghanistan on my third deployment and then um, have actually been a PSYOP officer since then. I stayed on active duty for um, just about 11 years and had five total deployments in that time frame. And now I have been, uh, I'm an instructor, which is great. I love being able to instruct for majors for the Command and General Staff Officers College as a reservist right now. So I've been connected to the military for um, what feels like longer than <laughs> like half of my life, which if you had asked me when I was 18 what that would look like, I this is not what I would have told you. Yeah, that is an uh, amazing background. And now at, at Tilson. And now at Tilson, right. So, um, I mean, I would say like my military experiences were sort of really hyper condensed too. So I had like an entire career's worth of experiences in like a 10-year time frame. <laughs> it was very intense and condensed. And so when I left active duty, um, I was not looking for that at all. My husband and I decided to move to Maine, like found a house, just moved to Maine. We said, we've done harder things. I didn't have a job. We didn't know people from here and uh, made the move. And it's been great. It's been the best move. I credit him with that decision. I'm not sure I would have made it (laughs) on my own. So I started working for Senator Susan Collins for a little bit and then um, ended up getting appointed by the governor running the Maine Bureau of Veteran Services. And it was in that position that I was doing a lot of outreach to veterans. And I did some outreach to my now CEO, Josh Broder, who uh, had won Maine Business of the Leader of the Year. And I just said, hey, you're a veteran. I'm a veteran. You hire veterans. Um, we should talk. And we did. And eventually it led to this role that I have now at Tilson, which is sort of like an HR function. I'm the executive vice president of workforce, but it really workforces, safety, marketing, communications, HR, our talent team, really in the military construct, he wasn't looking for an HR partner. He was looking for an executive officer. He's like, I kind of need this person, this function. And I know somebody who knows what that means intuitively. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was actually a really excellent partnership. And I've been at Tilson now for about four years. That's great. So you contributed to an article that we found fascinating when we, we saw this McKinsey piece titled, A Military Veteran Knows Why Your Employees Are Leaving. So first of all, the title just <laughs> was very catchy. How did you end up being part of that? 
like everyone, uh, you know, we were all, we all went home. We did, you know, crisis leadership, crisis management during the pandemic. And there's always a honeymoon period in crisis. You know, everybody sort of bonds together and then you figure something out. There's a lot of understanding. There's a lot more empathy. And the entire pandemic was a crisis, but you didn't know when it was going to end or what it was going to be like. As it started, however, and we all went home, went to work from home, but also had to manage people who were working in the field, making sure that they were safe or able to do their work safely. Right. It felt to me like in the pit of my stomach, I felt like I was deployed again. And I couldn't actually articulate that at first. I was like, man, I feel I have felt this before. What is it that I have felt before because I'm working from home now? It's not something I've ever done before. What am I feeling? And it started to really come together for me as I was getting tons of articles in the feed of uh, Facebook, LinkedIn news feeds that started to identify this great resignation phenomenon with a name, Mm -hmm. you know, and first it was the phenomenon. And then it was all of the thought leadership pieces, which were employers don't know what their employees want. Everybody's leaving because you've done so much crisis trying to keep people safe in the best way possible. And now they're leaving because you did something wrong. I just felt like those were such disconnected outcomes from the experience that you've had in crisis that brings you together. Why now would you totally just leave? Mm -hmm. And for me, I remember coming back from life-changing deployment experiences and feeling different and then feeling very disconnected from everything that happened at home or remained at home that I was putting some connections together from my own personal experiences, my own personal feelings, and seeing people not actually acknowledge that they, one, just went through a life-changing experience. They don't actually know how to process what just happened. And the world wants to move on. And the one place that the world wants to move on is in employment. Mm -hmm. Keep your job. Keep working. We've got to keep the economy going. How do those things come together? I wrote to McKinsey that had this thesis, employers don't know what their employees want. And I said, I have to tell you, I think you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I think you're wrong because employees actually don't know what employees want because people don't know what they want right now. And that's Mm -hmm. actually more important. And having already been through 20 years of deployments and the tons of aftermath and care, mental health care that comes post-deployment for service members, guess what? I think the entire world is going to need this for at least the next 20 years. This is not a business problem. This is not Amazon is a bad boss. This is people are in a really, really tough spot right now and don't know why. So can you tell us a little bit more about like what you learned during your deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan that really helped you better understand this trauma? I mean, it feels different, but you're making a a really kind of compelling connection here that I would have never thought about until I read your your piece. So I think trauma ultimately is in the eye of the beholder. You may experience something traumatic very different than how I experience it. And, and there's a word floating out there that's been very popular, which is resiliency for a couple of years. Like what does resiliency even mean? Mm-hmm. And my personal path from sort of identifying trauma to being resilient didn't happen because my leg was blown up. (laughs) It happened when I first got to West Point and I was in a totally different environment, getting yelled at, thinking, why did I make this decision? How am I going to survive this event? I got to get myself together. And all of the things that I didn't anticipate in that moment are the things that rattled me the most. And your resiliency is how you handle what you didn't anticipate and then move forward. And so for being deployed, there are things that you plan for. You know what the outcome is going to be because you know that death is the worst case scenario, but is also expected. It would make sense if I was in an IED and had severe traumatic brain injury. It's terrible, but 
it makes sense because I expect that that could be an anticipated outcome for me. What I didn't anticipate was not having like any type of food or water for a period of time. What I didn't anticipate was, you know, um, actually not being able to talk to my family for six months straight. The things that I had planned for are not the things that rattled me. It was everything else that I didn't plan for or anticipate that rattled me. Mm -hmm. And when you have that experience, it's how you as an individual define what was traumatic for you and how you move on. So while deployed, the entire experience was so different than anything I'd ever had before. And each one was different Mm -hmm. that I became different after each experience, which is normal, right? It is normal to become different and changed and grow after every experience. Sure. But I couldn't really identify how I was changing. I was less tolerant of people. I was more angry about certain things. And people identify, these are very common and normal attributes. Right. You have different perspectives. My perspective was about life or death. I didn't care about mundane activities anymore. I didn't care if my outfit didn't match or I didn't get flustered if my plane was delayed. Those things didn't matter to me anymore. So I became much more appreciative of the change process. And I think employees in general can't identify this massive traumatic event that they have had no control over. And when the trauma happens to you and you don't anticipate it, you don't have control over it. Right. So uh, my employer wants me to go back to work. Well, I've been working at home fine. Why do I have to go back to work? Do you not trust me anymore? Why is this? And, And they don't control it. So this lifeline, this difficult environment, people are scared. They're scared for their health. How are you going to keep me safe? I feel like I'm immune compromised. I don't want to tell you everything about my life. Mm -hmm. It's highly politically charged. I don't want to tell you everything about my political affiliations and how I really feel. Mm -hmm. All of those things were so tightly, and I think are to some extent still tightly, tightly integrated to the employee-employer relationship. And I think people just didn't even know how to articulate it, what to do with those feelings, and just were like, I've just had a life-changing experience. I have a different perspective. I don't want to be tied or tethered to something that I can't control right now. I can't. I just can't. I'm going to go do something totally different, bucket list item. I'm going to spread those wings because they've been pinned and clipped for too long now. That was something in your article that really resonated with me is, you know, the idea when somebody comes back from a deployment, sometimes they make major life changes like I get married, I get divorced, or big, big changes. And like, given the trauma that people have been experiencing from living and working through the pandemic, you know, is, do you feel like it's a good time to make major life changes? Or, you know, how would you coach people about that one? I have a colleague at work. He's, he's so funny. He always says like, No one should ever make major life changes in March in Maine. Um, It is the ugliest time of the year. You know, you can't, don't ever make a major life change. Something will get better. You won't feel so gray. And then with a clear head, you should make a major life change. So on the same vein, um, I don't think you should make a major life change, but that takes coaching and curating. Mm -hmm. And somebody has to be in the moment of self-awareness to say, man, I feel really different. Um, this, this change is either something I can embrace and navigate, or I don't know how I feel. I feel so out of control. I need to do the only thing I can control, which is a major life change. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sell my house. I'm going to get in an RV. I'm going to work from home on the road. I'm going to see all the sites I haven't seen, you know, any number of things. And I will say this, this connects to grief, not just the changes that what happened in COVID. We had millions of people actually die. Yeah. And every employee of an employer has and carries more actual grief in one period of time than ever before. The weight of grief on individuals in the world and in the office is heavier than it ever 
before, I think, in, you know, modern history that we can even think back to. Yeah. There is life-changing trauma that goes with not just coming back to the office, coming out of a pandemic, surviving for yourself, but the weight and the heft of the grief. I didn't get to go to the hospital. I couldn't help my loved one. Um, the powerlessness and the lack of control, again, for simple advocacy. I couldn't even travel to say goodbye. I didn't have closure for a period of time for memorial services. Mm -hmm. Those are all open wounds. And I think collectively, when I use the words trauma and grief, it's on a huge spectrum because it really is in the eye of the beholder, but it's all in the workplace. And we all process it differently. We process it at different times. I have been hyper experienced with this now. I don't process it in a delayed manner. I actually process it very quickly because I can make the connection for myself now. But if you've never had these before, you may not actually wrestle with the fact that you lost a loved one for another six months or a year. Yeah. We are really going through these very differently, even though we actually all went through this major life event at the same time. Yeah. Uh, your perspective, I, I just find so helpful to helping me understand and think differently, you know, about the whole experience. I'd like to know about Tilson, your organization. Now, I know the employees there have gone through a lot of changes, and I think it's helpful to hear about what other organizations have experienced, and there have been some changes that you've gone through there. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, we're a growth company, and um, I, I joke, um, what a growth company means isn't for an employee to think, oh, there's lots of opportunity for growth here. Um, what you should instead think is a growth company goes through growing pains mm. and uh, growing pains is figuring things out. And there is opportunity for growth when you go through struggle and pains and you figure something else out and you're like, oh, I'm not going to repeat that again. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for that. And so our company, which builds information infrastructure, was really at, um, you know, the the right place at the right time for a pandemic and certainly post pandemic for needing to build information infrastructure. So we're building information infrastructure um, that has really come out of the COVID demands of working from home and sort of the understanding of the real separation of and digital equity issues for rural communities who don't have high speed internet access. Mm -hmm. So we've hired a lot of people in a short period of time. We're going into communities where we've never been before. Um, we have people who are working from home and we've gone through a, to a full work from home um, schedule. We don't, if you want to be in the office, you can, you don't have to. And then we have people who are always in the field and in present mm -hmm. and together. It's a real mm -hmm. spectrum of workers under the same umbrella, you know, with the same objective to support this mission of um, closing the, the digital equity divide. So that comes with a lot of challenges and changes and knowing that everyone's at a different spot in their life is really an issue for us to remember, for leaders to remember, for us to coach managers through. We've had a lot of turnover and we have people who have started and said, I'm sorry, I just can't continue working. Mm. And they'll say, I can't continue working here. And the, I interpret, that as I have a lot of other things going on and you're asking me to do something that I'm actually not ready to do yet, but I can't tell you what that is. I really can't even tell you what that is. Mm. So I think we approach turnover from a different mindset. And I really look at turnover as an opportunity to give somebody a chance to go and come back when the time is right. I don't think that's normal. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Maybe that is sort of normal. I hope it becomes a more new normal that you have a chance to come back because I think we will, as people, make a lot of mistakes and holding it over each other's heads as just people 
and be like, oh, I could never go back to that company. You know, I left there in a huff and I pissed off my manager and all those things. Right. I don't think we should hold those hard feelings. Uh, I think we should acknowledge them for what they really are, just a point in time, mm -hmm. bad judgment because of bad experiences and welcome people back when the time is right. Mm -hmm. I really like that way of thinking about it. Another thing I wanted to ask you about is something that you had told us, like this has got to be the best job title possibly in the world. I don't know whether I could do this job, but I love the title and it's a beast counselor. And <laughs> I just am really interested in what is a beast counselor? What do they do and, and why do we need beast counselors? Oh, I really appreciate this question. So at West Point, they have uh, a really interesting position and function where the summer is your cadet basic training. So any new cadet who comes in goes through this basic training period. And the cadets, the upper class cadets, are the cadre. They're the squad leaders, the platoon sergeants, the company commanders, first sergeants. And the entire summer is for the cadets going through it, but the cadre break it up into two sessions. So there will be a set of cadre for the first half of the summer and a complete cadre rotation for the second half of the summer, mm. which is a very intentional and jarring experience for a new cadet who has finally gotten used to these people who are in charge of them. And now you have a new supervisor who's yelling at you again and doesn't know you. And it's very jarring. And there is one position that doesn't rotate throughout the summer. And every company has this one position, which is a cadet counselor. Beast is the uh, the name that we call cadet basic training. So Beast denotes that it's actually just the, the basic training period. So you're a Beast counselor uh -huh. and you don't rotate. You're the only one. So there's eight companies and eight counselors who are with the new cadets and help the old and the new cadre transition and they can report to the company commander. They could go and report to uh, an actual officer, not just a cadre, a cadet cadre member, and they can go anywhere. They can be on road marches and march with these cadets over here and this, they can go anywhere. And the whole point is to have a pulse of the organization, to be a consistent face, to be someone who's not in a leadership or a supervisory um, hierarchy who actually can have a psychologically comforting and safe environment to talk to somebody what's going on. And it's always occurred to me as I served as a beast counselor for that summer, why don't we have beast counselors like everywhere? Why isn't there one position in organizations, you know, that have this threshold where this person literally has no impact on your career. They have no impact on whether you're getting a promotion or not. They just help you, which is very different than the HR function, I think, for some resolution. Mm -hmm. But this is a person who can just go right to the CEO and say, hey, I think you have a problem in this department and division. I think we, need sh we should talk about this. This employee is having a hard time and bring it someplace. I think the flexibility, the autonomy, and the opportunity for both an employer and an employee to have a facilitator is more important than ever before. So I recommend Beast Counselors everywhere. <laughs> and I yeah, I love it. I love it. I think that's a brilliant idea. Another thing I wanted to ask you about, and I was fascinated by, you know, you being a self-proclaimed proponent of radical self-awareness and accountability. <laughs> and first of all, I have always wondered, how does one actually know if they are self-aware? Because I always think to myself, like, well, I think I'm self-aware, but maybe I'm just buying my own ideas about who I am and what I am. So I'm curious about that. But how do you think that people need to think differently right now uh, in order to kind of have a, a better work experience from what they have had? Uh, the article came out at the end of January 2022 and had a lot of attention. I mean, thousands of people from across the world. And it touched them at different times. And I knew having said, you know, before that people sort of, they experience trauma and they experience processing of grief and other aspects of it at different times. Just this past week, I have had like a flood of people actually reposting it and reading it for the first time. Like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense, which actually 
supports this delayed processing understanding. And so to segue into self-awareness, everybody's going through it at a different time. And I think the awareness that we lack on ourselves is actually transferred to other people. We see this about other people all the time. It's very easy to judge somebody else. It's very easy to say, oh, you know, you're a close talker. I don't like the way they do that in the meeting. And then quickly tell a peer or a coworker, someone else or a partner, you know, I, I really don't like it when this person does this at work. But we fail to turn around and think, if I'm thinking this and saying this about somebody, somebody is probably thinking and saying something about me. Mm -hmm. The opposite is rarely true. We rarely counter our own thinking with what our behavior actually is. And so when you talk about how do you know, I try to practice that personally if I'm feeling this way about someone, I really question whether or not someone's feeling this way about me and what that might mean. And I think starting there, starting with a practice of like balancing, counterbalancing your own thoughts on how you could be viewed, not just the way someone else could be viewed, is a really helpful entry into practicing self-awareness not just subscribing to it. Mm -hmm. You have to like generally subscribe to the concept, but it's really hard to turn around and, and do it yourself. And the more you get into an application of how you're thinking versus how other people might be thinking about you, you will naturally become less judgmental and more accepting. And when you can, through that lens, become more accepting of your coworkers, of your team, of your boss, because your boss went through the same thing, right? You may not like what your boss is doing, but your boss went through the same thing. You may generally come to problems, uh, resolutions, and solutions in general with a very different framework and perspective that like lowers the tension and the frustration for what it is and actually allows you to talk about the real issue. Yeah. So that's sort of a way to think about the practice of it in a work experience, because we have to do it ourselves. Self-awareness is about us. My company doesn't have a heartbeat. My company doesn't have fingers. My company is run by people. Mm -hmm. And if you blame the organization, then you actually are missing an opportunity to resolve something much closer to you that can directly affect you. And that is true for everyone. We are just people talking to people. That's it. That's what we are. Yeah. Uh, we have to find a better way to actually have healthier conversations in order to move past the the frustration that may may lie underneath. Yeah. So, Adria, this has been a great conversation. I feel like I could probably talk to you for a couple hours. I know that we don't have that much time today, so I just want to say again, um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your service. And thank you for sharing what you've learned in all of your experiences. Thank you so much, Chris. I really appreciate it. I hope that you and all your listeners find some value in this resonates with somebody and helps them on, you know, whatever their resiliency journey is following this crazy pandemic. Thank you. So joining us now is Nadia Johnson, and Nadia is the Director of Leadership and Adaptive Teams here at Steelcase, and she spends her time learning about how leadership is changing and helping to scale leadership training and coaching across the global organization. So thanks for being with me, Nadia. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks for inviting me. I'm so glad to talk to you about this because I was really struck first by Adria's article before we had a chance to interview her and then in the conversation with her. What I found so interesting was this idea that she connected our return to work or return to the office to her experience in the military with deployment and what it was like for military personnel to return from deployment. And she talked about how, you know, there's an experience that, you know, it's different for everybody, but it's a little predictable, you know, like they've done it enough and they have kind of a structure in place to help people when they're coming back to cope with the change and the trauma that they've been through. So now we have a lot of employees that are coming back into the workplace, and that was her point. And I'm just curious, 
what you think about where we are going or where we could be going to help people make this transition from going through a big trauma back into kind of like, just get back to it, you know, just get back to normal. I love the way she made that connection. Um, I think we've all talked about COVID a lot and it's this big thing that's happening, and, but it's a big different thing and there was no box to put it in and maybe what we should do. So I, I loved her connection because it does give the this idea that there's, hey, there's a roadmap that, that we could follow. It's not all um, going about in the dark. So I love that idea and I think it's really relevant. As I listened to her though, I remember thinking, there is a similarity in terms of like uh, the big deployment and coming back, but that experience has some closure. And mm -hmm. I think maybe one of the differences between um, the experience she's talking about and maybe what's also happening in the workforce is where's our closure? Uh, where are we? I mean, are we in? Are we out? Are we in endemic, pandemic? Um, and I think that lack of closure is maybe what's creating an extra layer of struggle. Um, but I think the experience is still very similar. I think it's so interesting to think about where we're at because I know there are a lot of people in kind of leadership roles who might be like, let's just be done and, you know, get over your trauma, people. <laughs> but you know, really, it was just such a life-changing event for so many people. And I'm just curious how you think we could begin to help people cope with that. And what do leaders need to do to help people cope with that, given that that's kind of an area of expertise for you? Well, um, I love to be the expert. Um, I wish I had all the answers. I'm, I'm not sure I do. But, but I would say that what our own research within Steelcase is showing us. We do some some work with leaders and understanding the needs of employees. Um, and what the research out there is also telling us when I participate in different external forums to kind of l drill into leadership, is right now probably the most important um, skill or trade a, a leader could practice is empathy. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just say, get off the struggle bus, or it's over, like, move on. And how do you really practice that? And it's almost impossible to practice empathy if you don't have a relationship um, with someone. And some of our own internal data is showing that, you know, one of the focus areas we need, and it's and it's not unique to us. Right. I, think, I think this would be outside of this company as well, some of the data shows, is how are you building those relationships across the teams that you're working with? Mm -hmm. So that for folks who are on the struggle bus, they have opportunities to connect. Mm -hmm. with each other, with you, and that's how they remain connected to the organization. Um, people don't just bond to, like, steel case. They bond to their leader right. um, and the right. team that they're a part of. And so this empathy factor becomes really incredibly important. The other thing that we really coach leaders to do as we interact with them is when you're in a terrible moment, one of the ways you can really focus and prime people is to really get them thinking about the future a little bit in a very hopeful way. Mm -hmm. And our data has shown, believe it or not, in the midst of all of this, the things that our employees are worried about and wondering about are their future. Sure. Like, where is my career going? What could be next? And I think with um, the article that we're discussing, you see that people are making choices to maybe leave. It's because they're thinking about those things. Right. And if you can help them see themselves where you are in the future and how that connects to their aspirations, both personal and career, I think that's the role we need from our leaders. So I was really interested in talking with her. She's very big into self-awareness. And... I was really interested in asking the big question, like, how do I know if I am self-aware, you know, or am I, am, I, am I just fooling myself? But I'm just curious what you think about this notion of, like, connecting what you were saying to empathy with self-awareness. Again, you know, as a leader, I might think I'm empathetic, but maybe not so much. Or, you know, as an employee, I might think it's somebody else's fault that I feel this way, but maybe not. I'm just curious, what do you think? I mean, I think she's on to something. Self-awareness um, plays a huge role because if you can't make it through the experience and process it and find meaning in it, meaning in it for yourself, it's really going to be very difficult to maybe recognize where someone's in the process of doing that, on the mm -hmm. verge of doing that, or stuck and unable to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, what we've talked about with our leaders a lot throughout the pandemic is this idea of, pausing and taking a moment to take care of yourself first, to do that processing, that reflection, and figure out where you are. Because unless you do that, you really can't show up for someone else. So I, I thought that was a really salient point that she made when she talked about that. 
I was also fascinated with this new role that she was exposed to in her military training. I think it was at West Point that as they were going through the training, they had a role that they called a beast counselor, which first of all, I just thought the name beast counselor sounds like a job that I would want to have because I want to have that on my business card. But the idea of the beast counselor was this person whose responsibility it is to kind of stay in touch with Uh, In that case, it was with students, but um, with cadets. But, you know, thinking about that, like in a corporate world, like to stay in touch with people and kind of keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening. And I'm just curious, what do you think? Should we have beast counselors in the workplace? I don't know. I, I remember hearing her talk about that, and I was intrigued by the idea. Because I think the the part about it that's most appealing to me is this idea that I could go to them in this moment of, yeah, I think I want to quit my job and not really put it out there, right? right you know, if I say right. that to my boss, who I have a great relationship yeah. with, now is she going to think I'm on the slow train or right. I, I want to exit the organization when I don't? Or you're quiet quitting. Or, or quiet quitting, yeah, yeah, another one out there. So I, I, I was intrigued from that part um, perspective. But I struggled mentally with how do we make that happen? Because I feel like that's such an important role of a leader to make that connection. In fact, it's almost that transcendent role. Like, you know you're there, right? If your employee could really have that conversation with you and it would just be in that moment. Mm -hmm. And it Mm -hmm. wouldn't leave that mark, right? That, That sort of stain. And so I guess I struggled with it. Like, could we do that? Like, is there a person who has that kind of capacity and inclination? And could they do it for all the people who need yeah, it right now? Yeah. So it, practically, that's that was what I struggled with because the structure was a little bit different in the mm-hmm. military, the way she talked about it. But I love the idea, and I think it touches on a very real need of spaces like that. You know, it gets back to that empathy piece, right? Because sure. when you're in the moment with someone and you're only there to be with them, right. you can do that. And I think it releases you of that judgment that maybe sometimes come with leadership because you have some other responsibilities as well mm-hmm. that are more related to the organization. So I think that's what she was getting at mostly, right? Yeah. Someone who's just there for the employee only um, without any other obligations or responsibilities or yeah. accountabilities in the greater organization. I'm talking myself into it as I, <laughs> <laughs> as I go through as it, I, as, I, as I think about it. Well, I've loved having a chance to chat with you, Nadia. This was really helpful to have somebody to kind of process through what we heard from Adria. So thanks for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here with us for this episode of Work Better. If you enjoyed the conversation, please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and visit us at steelcase.com slash subscribe to sign up for weekly updates on research insights and design ideas delivered to your inbox. Next week, we're talking to Kenny Cluett and he works with an organization called Ashoka. And if you haven't heard of it, it's a global organization whose mission is to mobilize a movement where everyone is a change maker in the world. And he's going to join us from Spain and share how organizations can find change makers, what makes them so special and valuable to companies, and how thinking about our communities outside of our office walls can actually strengthen our communities inside the workplace. We really hope you'll join us next week. Thanks again for being here, and we hope your day at work tomorrow is just a little bit better. This episode of Work Better is produced by Rebecca Cherbowski. Creative art direction is by Aaron Ellison and Emily Cowdery. Technical support is from Mark Caswell and Jose Jimenez. Digital publishing is by Aureli Ariano and Jordan Marks. And editing and sound mixing by Soundpost Studios.